rum, red rum. In my book, The Shining, Danny Torrance was just learning how to read, and he was going to see this word in the mirror, and I immediately thought, well, he would see murder. What is murder backwards? And when I saw it was red rum, I thought to myself, boy, that's just perfect. The first time I saw that word on that blackboard cracked into it on set was magical. I felt that way when I read that chapter of Dr. Sleep. It was one of the most satisfying and exciting parts of reading Dr. Sleep for me, and I felt that way on set, too. And the minute we came around the corner and saw that, it was awesome. One of the first jobs I ever tried to pursue once I was able to really pursue movies was Dr. Sleep. I sent Steve the script as soon as I finished. I was terrified of what he was gonna think. His reaction to the script uh, was overwhelmingly positive. He said, this is the kind of movie that is so good, they're never gonna make it. And I got to respond to that by saying, actually, it was just greenlit. Rolling, rolling. At its core, Dr. Sleep is the continuation of the story of one of horror's most affecting and iconic characters, and that is Danny Torrance. This is the rest of his journey. This is him still out there dealing with The Shining in a world that is dark and horrifying. You ain't talking, huh, Doc? The chance to revisit that world and this incredible character is what drew me to the project. The fact that I got to make the movie was an ultimate honor and surprise. I just wanted to see it. Come on, come on. Yeah, don't worry about me. Just go, just go, go, go. One of the things that I believe very much about horror cinema in general is that your genre elements are only as strong as your characters. And that's something that I learned reading Stephen King for a lifetime. As a writer, I have ideas in my head, but I never see the character himself. There's very little physical description in my books. I don't see him because I'm behind his eyes. But when you're in the movie, you stop thinking, this is Ewan McGregor playing Danny Torrance. You think to yourself, it's Dan Torrance. He's the character that I wrote. I'd played Dan Torrance, which is about the horror of what happened with his father and losing his father at the age of five. I'm thinking about my dad. He also stood in a room like this once, wanting to get well. I felt like that little boy, having gone through this terrible experience, how does he carry on and how does he deal with his shine? Hi. Hi, Abra. One of the things that just amazed me was Abra. She's terrific. If anyone asks, your mom uncle. Uncle Dan. I was very nervous about finding the right Abra, and we saw almost a thousand young actresses, and Kylie Curran rose to the top. I'd like to welcome to the set for her first day of work, Kylie Curran. <laughs> Mike works amazing with actors. To help me prepare, he called me and you went in for a director's meeting, and he told us about his vision, and we're a good team, I think. Don't chase these people. I would start the letter writing campaign to Steve now, asking for more Abra Stone stories. Abra yeah. the middle years. Abra, do you hear me? They come back. If you had more, I'd be, I'd be all over them. It's a possibility. I would never say never. <laughs> Rebecca, as Rose the Hat, is just amazing. She's so beautiful and so evil. Well, hi there. You're wondering why I'm wearing such a funny hat. And the hat is perfect. I actually found a hat that's an original from the period that's beaver felt. It's 100 years old. It's a top hat, which is about that high. And so we basically chopped it and made it the lower sort of scale to Rebecca and added some details. This is a great little torture. Can you see this? This one goes far in underneath children's nails, and that creates a lot of pain and torture, which basically means a lot of steam. <gasps> Nothing in my hat. For me, the whole essence of Rose and the true knot, it's the primal emotions, being a part of something, sex, feeding. <gasps> Only that we feed on children, we eat the steam. You are a special little thing, aren't you? 
As to where the true knot was born, where the idea came from, I drive back and forth between Florida and, and Maine a lot. And at a lot of the rest areas, the rec vs are always parked together. And I thought to myself, those are full of Satan worshipers who travel across the country casting evil spells. And that gradually morphed into vampires that were living on the essence of these special kids that have some kind of paranormal power, that that power could be sucked out of them. Please! I won't tell anyone! Please! Let me go, please! They'd been around for so long, the wardrobe department tried to incorporate all sorts of trinkets into their fashion. When you glance at them, they just seem kind of weird. But if you go and, and really scrutinize the details, you can see decades, if not centuries, of little souvenirs that they've kept. My backstory was I used my shining for gambling. I'm probably 500 years old, but some of them, like Grandpa Flick, is thousands of years old. We are the true knot. What is tied cannot be untied. They need each other, and they each have their own kind of specialty. I think Crow Daddy came from the French Indian Moors. He was a tracker. Rose the Hat found him, uh, interned him, and uh, that's how he became so close to Rose. Mike Flanagan gave us a lot of creative liberties where we could come up with our own ideas for our character, which is such a gift for an actor. And with Apron Annie, Moroccan times of, you know, the 1500s is when she got picked up by Grandpa Flick. She was wearing a head wrap and she took it off, left her life behind, and she wore it as an apron after that. Terry, our costume designer, just wanted Silent Sari to be quite flowy. Originally, we had an idea of Joan of Arc. I've actually like cut my hair quite short for, for the part. We wanted to have this like sort of androgynous look for her with like these big eyes and just, you know, have her be quiet and always watching and always. So it's really about kind of what you guys feel, how you want to interact with each other on this one. If I was doing anything off the character, then Mike would step right in. But he also lets us have a lot of freedom to sort of play with how we feel these characters would be. Breathe deep. Mike is my brother. He gave me a call and was like, hey, do you want to come out and do the film? And this was a, a larger project than I'm used to working on. I was very surprised that he asked it all and uh, very pleased to be here. I was working as a set medic for Mike Flanagan, and I put in for the set medic for the show. And uh, I didn't get it, and I sent him a text saying, hey, I didn't get make the position, but, you know, thank you for the shot anyway. Matt worked with me on The Haunting of Hill House, and when I was thinking about this group, I, I thought it could be fun, too, to have someone who isn't an actor, and Matt just ate it up. We had this incredible movement coach called Terry Notary, who is just God to me. And we were talking about the acting of bug-like creatures, that we all have these animals within ourselves, but the way we feed, the way we move, the way we eat or communicate to each other is all based upon the inner creature. Parlor tricks, just parlor tricks. And it's also a creature that will display itself when we ourselves cycle. Get out of there! Get out of there! Which is our death. Certainly one of the most impactful moments of the book is the murder of Bradley Trevor. It is a point of inflection in the story um, that is unspeakably visceral. Hey, 19. It's OK. We're friends. The murder of a child was one of the hardest things I've, I've had to read. Certainly one of the hardest things we've had to film. Mike and I had worked with Jacob Tremblay before in a movie called Before I Wake. And with respect to Bradley Trevor, we needed someone who was going to make an impression. And there aren't many actors that age or any age who can do what Jacob Tremblay did in this movie. I had wanted it to be a surprise when we saw, you know, what, who might be the most recognizable young actor in the business show up in the film, only to then brutally kill him on screen. <laughs> Jacob had been practicing on his own to do this scene, and when he finally did his first take, we at the monitor were, our jaws hit the floor, we couldn't look at it. The actors playing the true knot, who had been full of swagger before the camera rolled, was like, yeah, we're gonna go kill this kid. We're the, we're the monsters. <laughs> we're literally so shaken that they had to step away from the set. No! 
<laughs> I'm watching this scene, and I just feel tears. Are you gonna hurt me? Yeah. <laughs> we were shaking, and uh, Mike comes over. He's like, "Great, can't use any of your expressions because you guys are supposed to be enjoying this." And Jacob dusted himself off, high-fived his dad, and went to Crafty because he was having a blast doing this. I thought this was rated G. <laughs> We were very lucky to have Bob Kurtzman rejoin us to do the special effects makeup. There's a scene where Rose's hand is smashed into the file cabinet drawer. Oh! It's hard to look at, but you know, it was Bob Kurtzman who designed it, who also did the degloving for us in Gerald's game. So it's old hat to us now how to mangle hands. We're, we're getting really good at it. We did a f an initial sculpt version and then tested it on Marcy's hand and then Mike gave notes he'd wanted l less. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up re-sculpting it and then Rebecca really knows how to sell it, which is, yeah. helps us as well. She knows how to bend the finger and make it look dangly. Mike Fanning gets his famous destroyed hand sequence. Yeah! It's an honor <laughs> to have your hand savaged in a Mike Flanagan film. Michael Fimignari, who has been the DP for nearly all of the movies Mike and I have done, is an essential element to us. Michael and I approached this knowing that we were not only going to be paying homage and reverence to the aesthetics that Stanley Kubrick had established, but that we were also building our own new world, um, that we were building three of them, actually, that we were responsible for creating a beautiful aesthetic for Dan's world and for Abra's world and for Rose's world. And that was some of the most intense fun that we had on this. Well, well, well. Hi there. We're doing the finale of the movie, and this is the showdown between Rose and Danny in the Colorado Lounge. And the sequence where he has an ax, he's holding her off, he swings the ax at her, which he deflects, it hits her in the shoulder, she rips it out winds up poking him in the leg, and then uses the ax like a pitchfork to throw him down the stairs. Our stunt double, Stephen Atkinson, is gonna get flung down the stairs by Rebecca. Ready, three, two, one, go! First time ever stunt, air ram, stair fall. Give it to Stephen, guys. I've always believed that in its best expression, horror is the safe space for us to take a hard look at the darkest corners of who we are. There it is. And to me, it's about so much more than scaring you in a dark theater. But underneath it all, it's a catharsis that isn't about indulging these dark ideas. It's, it's about confronting them. I think what makes it important is that we can also say, this is why it's important to stand up in the world when you see an injustice. This is why it's important to shine. When I first met you, I told you that you should keep your shine out of sight. But I was wrong. There can be no horror if there isn't caring and love. Mm -hmm. That's very important, and I think a lot of filmmakers miss that, and uh, Mike doesn't. Mike, Mike understands. Shine on, Aberstone. You shine on.